Greeting friends and welcome to this week's edition of SMIE Consulting's Midweek Roundup. My name is Marty Bennett. I'm the president of SMIE Consulting and I take this opportunity each Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern to present uh, some my takes on issues of uh, importance in the international education field. Uh, it's a field I've been lucky enough to call my home for the last 25 years and one that I'm, I, I'm proud to say that uh, uh, I've, I've met people from around the world that uh, are uh, to this day close friends and I hope uh, through these regular chats we get a chance to reconnect uh, on, uh, on topics that are of importance to us all. Uh, but I hope today at least to cover a few topics that uh, you may find uh, important as you, uh, as you evaluate uh, where your institution is or where your organization is in international education. So for me, uh, today what we'll do is we're going to cover three main topics as we like to do each week. And welcome, Sana. Uh, good to see you again. Thanks for being a regular uh, participant in uh, these uh, week ch weekly chats. Um, my, my goal first is to cover uh, a recent report that came out from, uh, from out of the UK, uh, the MAC committee, and that's uh, for those unfamiliar uh, with that term in the UK, uh, that stands for uh, the Migration Advisory Committee. Uh, they have uh, been studying uh, for the last couple of years uh, the impact of what uh, increasing the length of time uh, for uh, or creating a different visa category for post work post study work would would be like would look like for university students in the UK. Uh, I'm going to post the article that uh, came out of the Pi News uh, last week, and it's uh, actually a couple days ago, in fact. And it does reveal uh, an important uh, uh, step uh, in the development of uh, the UK's uh, immigration um, debacle, frankly, uh, and how it's impacting uh, U UK universities uh, in the fallout from Brexit as that continues. Uh, this was um, uh, a report that was not uh, not anticipated to be one that was particularly favorable to universities in the UK, but uh, what it had done, and it has now contributed to kind of a, a reversal of, of a trend that uh, the government was hopefully moving away from, uh, but to, to, to relaxing uh, regulations related to international students in the UK, but to not include them in migration net, net migration numbers in that country. Uh, that decision looks also uh, unlikely to be reversed now. Uh, uh, following on from the SMAC report, there's been stories recently about uh, the recommendation also being to uh, to not uh, to continue to include international students in net migration numbers. Uh, the ruling up from the MAC, uh, again the Migration Advisory Committee, uh, did look at uh, the opportunity for. Um, uh, for ex for uh, for a new visa category uh, to for post study specifically in the post study work specifically in the UK, uh, but it did not uh, recommend that separate post study work visa. Uh, they said that it could be accomplished. The goals of this uh, having a post study work visa could be accomplished within uh, their own proposals that they are making to uh, to the government. So it mostly impacted, uh, the report argued for an extension to current PhD visas to embed one year of work rights as a standard and a further extension to a trial for those studying master's courses uh, as a way to enhance uh, UK STEM fields. Uh, they uh, do not have in the UK the, uh, the, the equivalent of the STEM OPT uh, that uh, the that U.S. international students have related to uh, three years of work uh, work possibility after each degree, bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degree in the field of study. So uh, the uh, the Migration Advisory Committee suggested this be extended to two years uh, instead of one. 
So that's uh, unfortunately not uh, as significant as they were hoping uh, for the group. Uh, and that's the group that I'm talking about here is uh, Universities UK. Uh, that uh, they were just they have come out and expressed that they are very disappointed with the main recommendations. Um, to not include a separate post-study work visa. And I guess this would be, uh, in the U.S., this would be the equivalent of having a separate category for OPT, a uh, separate visa for OPT, uh, whereas in the U.K., or in the U.S., you now have the ability to have your OPT as part of your study time, and that's the, basically what the um, Migration Advisory Committee is recommending continue in the U.K., uh, instead of a separate post-work to study visa. Uh, in, the, in the U.S., students can transition from their time on OPT, still in their F1 student status, to H1B if they find a company willing to sponsor them for that visa category. But for the most part, that right now is not, um, not an option moving forward in Britain. So uh, some fairly negative news uh, for uh, the, this would this new category would potentially help uh, make the UK more attractive to uh, to international students. And the, the, the quote coming out of the UK was, uh, "This improved post-study visa would put us on a par with what is offered by countries such as the, as the US, Canada, and Australia." Um, so it's unfortunate for uh, British universities there that uh, they will not be uh, benefiting from this potential change. Uh, that has been uh, not recommended for uh, for uh, for to the UK government. Interestingly, though, uh, we're also seeing the MAC acknowledge that there is a, a problem in the sector, and uh, they did see the quote was, "We do not see any upside for the sector in leaving the EU." So, and that's uh, that kind of fairly obvious uh, uh, statement coming out of, the, out of that advisory committee. So it's interesting that, uh, and many are calling it in the field, in, in the international field, particularly in the UK, calling it a missed opportunity uh, and it's likely to have a negative impact. So uh, that these will be increased barriers to, uh, to what British universities are trying to accomplish in their international education policies. So that, that's the first story that uh, I point out today, and then one that, well, I think uh, it's, it's one story, small story, in the part of a larger trend in the UK, certainly post-Brexit, to uh, retrench a little bit and by the, on the part of the government and becoming um, a less welcoming destination to international students. And certainly um, our folks here in the US uh, can relate to uh, that kind of retrenchment intentionally or unintentionally by uh, other policies the, inst the governments have in been implementing that make it a harder job for those in international education to really uh, move forward in. So uh, to move on to another topic, and this is kind of the other end of the spectrum here. Uh, in Australia, we have uh, a news story coming out about uh, it's, it's not, it hasn't made major press or, uh, in the industry yet, but it's something I picked up on. It just came out late last week uh, study from masterstudies.com. And they're a student-facing uh, site uh, that uh, prospective students who are looking at master's degrees around the world can access uh, for uh, university options in different countries. Uh, Australia, as those in the field will know, has benefited uh, uh, quite significantly over the last uh, last few years, four or five years, uh, in terms of their uh, how they are viewed in the global international student market, and uh, there's been increases uh, from 187,000 international higher ed students in 2013 to over 319,000 in 2018, according to some estimates. So a very significant increase, almost a doubling. Uh, probably 75%, 80% increase in a five-year period. So that's a, a significant jump, and uh, that's attributed to a lot of world issues that, uh, uh, that uh, with fallen interest in the U.S., in the U.K., uh, Australia, and certainly Canada, as we've discussed in previous uh, chats, has become a real beneficiary of, um, of, of what's happened in other countries, much like frankly, in the late 90s, uh, 
the U.S. was seen as a more attractive destination, even this is post 9-11 drops, was seen as an increasingly uh, more, more attractive destination for international students. Uh, this is at a, at a time when Australia was having some negative publicity, particularly in India, uh, with uh, students that had been victims of crime. In, in Australia and the negative impressions that, they, uh, uh, that the Australian populace in some places was having towards uh, the, t these, uh, these visitors uh, who were attending universities in those countries, in their, in their country. So this news story is about Australia National University, uh, one of the top, US, uh, top universities in Australia, uh, where the vice chancellor made the statement, uh, according to an Australian news source, that uh, the the university had reached a size which I think is appropriate, and that meant that we're putting a halt to expanding their international enrollment for the time being. Uh, that the phrase halting their international enrollment is something is, an, is a phrase that's used in the article here uh, that I've uh, put into the comments section that you can look at for your at your own at your on your own time uh, or now as we go along, but the. Uh, the, inst the institution at Australia National uh, has seen dramatic enrollments in their uh, international student enrollment over the last uh, few years. Uh, article points out that, that they have doubled, uh, more than doubled, well, more than double the increase in their domestic students between 2013 and 2016. Uh, they are now up to over 7,400 international students out of a total student population of only 20,000. So, uh, what does that mean? That means that over a third of their internet, third of their student body is international in Australia. And I've touched on this topic uh, uh, several times before in terms of what that actually means. Uh, when you look at uh, the number of students that are enrolled uh, at universities and international students as a percentage of that, uh, the average in most uh, most uh, universities is somewhere in the range of, <laughs> and I'm trying to look at my chart at the, where I have this written down. It's approximately, uh, in Australia, uh, the average international students as a percentage of total higher ed in Australian uh, higher education institutions is 24%. In the UK, it's 21%. In Canada, it's about 15, 16%. Uh, in the US, it's only 5 Five percent, uh, and that's largely due to the breadth of institutions, uh, a number of institutions that we have in the United States, with over four thousand five hundred post-secondary institutions, compared to Australia, which has uh, has forty or less, uh, Canada, which has a hundred, the UK, which has one hundred and sixty or one hundred seventy, under two hundred for sure. But there are certainly um, reasons why there those countries have done well. Because uh, there's there's fewer institutions that those international students that are going to that country can uh, frankly attend, so uh, it, it it concentrates uh, international students uh, in particular pockets. And Australia National University now has over a third of their uh, students uh, being coming from abroad, and that's been uh, noted by the uh, by the uh, by the vice chancellor that that's too many. So uh, it's, a, it's a challenge now for that institution uh, in the international ed uh, department to uh, recalibrate in terms of what they're going to do and figure out what, uh, what may be the next steps for them. Uh, so where do, where do, where do institutions, uh, are, there, are there gonna be other institutions in Australia that go down this similar path? That's a good question, I, I don't know. Uh, frankly, it's a, it's a situation that as a Canadian and, and Australian schools that are already 15 to 24 percent of their student bodies are international and those numbers are going to be growing because of the concentration of international students in a limited number of schools in those countries. I think um, you've seen in the past uh, this, these large concentrations in, at Australian institutions that's led to some, some political or local uh, uh, domestic uh, discontent about our places uh, being lost uh, that could be going to nationals of our country uh, to that, sh that should be attending our own institutions. So little shades of xenophobia popping up there. Uh, that there could be more of that depending on, um, on how, that, how that situation gets resolved or how, how much more, what capacity there really is to grow international enrollments in Australia. 
Uh, they're certainly by far of the top sending, top receiving countries in the world. They are by far the country that receive, that has the highest percentage of international students with um, almost a quarter uh, on average uh, at their institutions are international now. So where's the room to grow there? Probably not as dramatic as it is in countries like the, the U.S. where only five, less than 5% or around 5% are from overseas. So we'll see where that goes, but uh, worth noting this as kind of a place mark, a bookmark for uh, maybe future, uh, future trends in the industry. Uh, in, in countries like Canada and, the, and, and Australia that are going to be and have been benefiting from drops in international or flat rates of international growth in the U.S. and the U.K. and other English uh, markets. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, the third story I'd like to, like to close with today is uh, one I had the privilege of uh, being a part of uh, this, this past summer. Uh, for those who are members of NAFSA, you may be familiar with the IEM Spotlight. Uh, that's the International Enrollment Management uh, newsletter uh, that comes out two or three times a year. Uh, I think it's three times a year now. And it addresses uh, kind of general topics uh, related to uh, international enrollment management. And this, uh, this month's or this session's topic, uh, this edition's topic is uh, on Anglophone countries and English language uh, programs. So um, I was asked to write this article uh, that I'll, I'll be sharing with you in a moment here on uh, the meaning of required English proficiency and how that varies dramatically from country to country. So for me, uh, this was a, uh, a bit of a research project. I certainly had had, uh, had a lot of experience at different institutions uh, working with uh, in, uh, the administrations to f determine what appropriate English language uh, requirements would be for incoming international students. Uh, and uh, some interesting stories I'll share, one, at least one of which I'll share with you. Uh, but what is important about this topic is, and the article is entitled, uh, What Does Having Required English Proficiency Mean in International Student Admissions? Uh, what, that, uh, what that article does uh, go through, it's a nice overview, I think, of, um, and the, the link is uh, on the NAFSA site uh, as part of the IEM Spotlight newsletter, and it shows, uh, uh, talks about it from a, a mainly a U.S. perspective, but does cover what's happening in uh, the U.K., in Australia, in Canada, and uh, other, other countries that have um, developed uh, more robust, let's say, uh, policies related to what constitutes English language profici proficiency coming from international students uh, that uh, are not what they consider native speakers. So there's even just debate over what, at a lot of U.S. schools, over what constitutes an English, a native English language speaker. Because uh, ultimately, and uh, uh, in the interests of uh, truth in advertising. Um, my, one of my uh, consulting uh, uh, opportunities I have now and have for the last four years has been with British Council IELTS. Uh, so certainly uh, ha having some background working with an Engli one of the major English language uh, testing organizations in the world, uh, it's given me per some perspective on this from, from that side of it. But what I, what I will say, and in the article, what I uh, do make a point of is that um, that U.S. policies related to English language proficiency uh, do tend to be fairly uh, limiting uh, for prospective international students and that the reliance, over-reliance perhaps on anyone who is not uh, an English native language speaker, uh, uh, giving them no options to uh, other than taking a TOEFL, IELTS, PTE, academic, or one of the many up-and-coming uh, language tests that are out there, uh, their over-reliance on those tests as the only determinant of whether a student uh, can meet the minimum requirements uh, for con con starting a full course of study from the start, I think that's, uh, that's something that is really an, is, is an area where I think in terms of, particularly now <laughs> in this environment that uh, the U.S. Uh, inter and certainly international higher education folks uh, find themselves in, uh, you see a lot of institutions that are struggling uh, to, uh, to keep up, uh, that are losing students to Canada, 
whether it be in MBA programs or uh, STEM fields, they're losing uh, students abroad to other institutions. Uh, we've made the point on the on the pod on this uh, chat before that we were seeing a lot of institutions uh, realize that their competition is not just their uh, partner or other universities in their uh, in their wheelhouse, so to speak, in in their countries. It's also universities outside uh, their uh, outside this country, and that's something that I think American universities, if they're going to remain competitive, certainly need to be more aware of the global competitive nature of uh, what's happening. And this, these English language policies can be a way to help distinguish themselves and set themselves apart and provide perhaps a more welcoming environment for students. And the article, what, what it does do, uh, looks at the different countries that are uh, in, involved in the Anglophone world uh, in international student recruitment uh, on large scales. And it, just covering the four major destinations, US, UK, Australia, and Canada, uh, there is, there's, what's, what is clear, there's little agreement on what, uh, what, these, what the distinctions are. Uh, so what, uh, what, I've, uh, what I concluded through this assessment, uh, there are, uh, the US universities uh, are generally not, uh, not having a very broad definition of what a native language uh, student would be. Uh, in terms of Wikipedia, Wikipedia defines that very, uh, very broadly, uh, that uh, there, are f there are 54 sovereign states and 27 non-sovereign entities that have English as an, an official language, and whether that's de facto uh, in that just um, like in the United States, it's, the English, surprisingly, is not a national language, official language. Uh, but in, in law, but it is in fact uh, that this is where um, the majority of uh, Americans speak English. Uh, it's language of instruction in the schools, all of those things. So uh, how, are, how is English viewed, uh, English la native language policies defined? In, in a lot of uh, institutions, there could be as few as seven countries that meet uh, a student who's educated in that country or uh, is considered a native language speaker of English. Uh, could that list of countries could be as small as seven? It could be as large as 40 uh, in, in, a, in the number of countries that are included on that list. Generally, um, on, the, on the, the, the low side, we see the uh, University, University, University of Chicago includes only Australia, Ireland, New Zealand, UK, US, and English-speaking provinces or institutions in Canada and South Africa. So uh, that they must, the student must be a native, and, and at the University of Chicago, the student must be a native of or has studied in full-time status for at least one academic year within the last five years in one of those seven countries. They would get uh, in exemption from having to take the TOEFL and, and, uh, and would meet the necessary English language requirement. So other, other, con other, other institutions, uh, uh, one at, that I wor worked at, uh, Ball State uh, in Indiana, had 39 different institutions that qualified. Uh, but students who, and uh, this was a policy we implemented while I was director there, uh, students could supplement or substitute suitable scores on the SAT verbal at the time, reading evidence-based reading and writing now, uh, or ACT 21 on English uh, to meet the uh, English language proficiency requirements. Uh, in order to do that, uh, that requires a lot of work uh, with your English language program the department who, or whoever has uh, control over or final say on uh, policy related to um, students meeting uh, native language requirements or English language proficiency requirements. So generally if you're not a native of one of those countries or been educated in one of those countries that was on a particular university's list, you'd have to take a TOEFL or IELTS or other, other exam. So what, uh, what this, what this uh, article addresses is, uh, is, I think, uh, the reluctance on, of U.S. institutions to really uh, consider other options. Uh, one, where one, uh, one country or one institution that actually does uh, take a, a, mo a more broad view, much broader view of uh, what required English proficiency, how that can be met, uh, is, uh, is Green River uh, Community College in Washington State. Uh, they uh, have a comparable list to University of Chicago in terms of the, like, 
countries that where they would qualify for exemptions, but they look at alternate credentials uh, to meet English language requirements. They look at SAT scores. They look at Cambridge GCE or IGCSE uh, scores in, in English, where it's not ESL, where they score C of higher, that they've complete uh, appropriate, um, uh, they, li they also work closely with seven different intensive language English programs in the United States or abroad. They also consider, and this is an area where I think there's mo a lot of room for growth uh, in terms of secondary school exam results that can qualify a student from other countries, that can qualify a student to meet English proficiency requirements. And as you can imagine, these relate primarily to uh, European countries, Denmark, Finland, uh, Germany, Netherlands, uh, Norway, and Sweden are on their list uh, where their minimum um, grade levels in a, either A-levels or uh, Abitur in, uh, in Germany, in uh, Netherlands, the VWO, uh, HAVO or MBO uh, exams, particular grades on those can exempt students. From Norway, it's if they've had high, a high school English grade of four or higher. In Sweden, if they've had their upper secondary school grade of VG in English. And uh, they also include Singapore and Nigeria on their lists here uh, as, um, as exam results from secondary school marks in those countries can get them exemptions. So that's, uh, I think, a sh uh, an example of where I think a number of U.S. institutions can and should be moving to broaden the scope of, uh, of credentials that can qualify them for, uh, inter for exemptions from uh, English language testing requirements. Uh, we also see in other countries, uh, and the article per uh, goes, through, as I mentioned, goes through Australia, where they look at work experience for at least the last two years in one of their countries that they have, a laundry list of countries that they have on their native language criteria uh, list, that if they've had full-time study for at least one year, so this could be a student that has studied abroad in one, their last year of their bachelor's degree program and might be looking to come to Australia. If they've studied in an English-speaking country on their list, then that would qualify them. If they've had residency in an English-speaking country for at least five years. Uh, this uh, is, again, this, these criteria I'm re relating to you now from Australia are from the University of New South Wales. Uh, and the final, is, uh, the final exemption uh, potential is uh, scores on the GMAT exam. So uh, they do not, do not specifically define what an English-speaking country is on, the, on that list, so that's probably the one drawback that that, that institution's uh, exemption list has. The University of Sydney, Sydney defines two different paths uh, for English language proficiency testing. Uh, one of those is completing secondary or being, becoming exempt from English language testing. One of those is uh, completing secondary school or a year of university study uh, in a, one of 14 countries uh, in, that they define. Uh, the options, if they're not in that group, they'd have to have, have completed their secondary studies in English in one of their 17 countries where the language of instruction is English, entirely in English. Uh, and, and they list off GC advanced A levels, IB, SAT or ACT exams, or completing a specific langu English language subject in a recognized secondary qualification. And they list many of the same uh, qualifications that I mentioned earlier from Green River uh, Community College. So they in also include a particular exam from Malaysia uh, and, and Hong Kong. Uh, on that list that uh, we're not on the Green River list. So you see some uh, examples there. Uh, Canada tends to look at, look at it much like Australia. They'll look at exam results in those fields. Uh, I mentioned IB, GCSE, um, other things like that. The University of Toronto uh, does include exemptions for students in one of 50 countries where the, they say the dominant language is English. Uh, so that if they've completed four or more years of full-time study in one of those countries, the one of those 50 countries. Uh, McMaster's University uh, handles it a little differently. They'll exempt students that have studied at an accredited secondary school or post-secondary school in an English-speaking countries, but no list is provided for three years prior to enrollment. Uh, so there's a, a lot of variation there, and I think what's important is there's three general areas that institutions can be looking at when it comes to uh, alternatives to just taking a TOEFL, IELTS, PTE, academic, in terms of providing prospective international students a wider range of possibilities for getting themselves exempt. Uh, first is, uh, is, is looking at uh, 
is, is alternative credentials, uh, alternative criteria, and then a broader definition of what can, constitutes uh, exemptions. Uh, so I think it's really important to, uh, to what countries are coming from. So the alternative credentials, exams, or criteria, as some of these Australian universities have provided, I think helps uh, an institution present a more welcoming approach, uh, more uh, open environment to international students. Uh, I know this is not an easy, easy task at all. I know we've, I've seen uh, one, of my, one of my trusted colleagues in the field, uh, who many of you might know, uh, Burl Marin, uh, who worked uh, for a number of years with, I, with IELTS at British Council, but also with, uh, with Cambridge English. Uh, has, has, uh, I, I asked the other day, or I, after I released this article yesterday, I uh, got in a, a bit of a discussion with her about what that means. And she had, had some interesting comments on that. Uh, she had mentioned that uh, international, uh, that it's really institu up to institutions that to be tracking, if they're going to be looking at al alternate, uh, alternate test scores, they should be looking at the track record of, for, of academic success for their international students coming in based on their various tests and standards. Uh, and also, uh, it, they need the money to do it. And frankly, uh, do, doing that in-depth academic study on a micro or macro level, it's a, it can often be a guessing game. But certainly, um, uh, she makes the point that uh, test score requirements should be reviewed every few years anyway uh, by ESL faculty uh, to determine, determine if they need to be adjusted. Uh, and it's really, the field is one that uh, is only, uh, or this issue in the field is one that I think is going to get increased attention and should get increased attention by, uh, by institutions that are, are really looking to find um, ways that they can uh, reverse a downward trend uh, to make themselves uh, more open and welcoming and really look at different ways that uh, they can make their, themselves uh, more attractive to international students and their families. So that's, that's my thoughts today. I uh, appreciate you joining me again. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see you uh, popping on for periods of time and I look forward to continuing these conversations uh, in the coming weeks. Thanks again for joining us. Cheers.